are watching Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Welcome to the first video episode of Neo Cash Radio. Tether has received subpoenas from U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. No more crypto ads on Facebook, and Open Bazaar integrates Bitcoin Cash and Zcash. All this and more, episode 241, here on Wednesday, January 31st. 2018. In the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,347, silver's down to $17.30, oil's down to $64.76, and then the Dow is down to 26,080 points. And the U.S. 30-year U.S. Uh, Treasury yield is up to 2.946%. Now, that, that means everything's down because technically when the yield goes down, the value of the Treasury, or when the yield goes up, the value of the Treasury goes down. So, there's a lot of money that sloshed out of the U.S. market or the, the markets this, this, this week. And in the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin Cash down to $1,484. Bitcoin Segwit is down to $10,130. Ethereum is up to $1,102. Dash is down to $689. And Litecoin is down to $162. Thank you, Darren. And Pedro, if you are listening to Neocash Radio with an audio-only version, you're missing out on seeing our pretty faces. That's right. We've begun a soft launch of the video version of Neocash Radio that will culminate with a new website and more. You can uh, also plan on seeing more of myself as I start a new series called Neocash Newscast. I will be publishing smaller, more news-focused videos more often, so look for those on our blog, YouTube channel, and all other locations you've been downloading the podcast. So just to recap... We have video now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like and share the videos. Neocash Media YouTube channel. So starting out right away, the, the top story, of course, is the U.S. CT, uh, CFTC subpoenas Bitfinex and Tether. So on December 6th, about, well, more than a month ago, now look, coming up on two months ago, the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission sent subpoenas to Bitfinex and Tether. At the time, there were about 189, uh, 119 million U.S. dollar tethers in circulation. Since then, the number of tethers has more than doubled. At the time of this podcast, there are more than 2.28 billion U.S. dollar tethers in circulation. The history of tether token creation reminds me of using cheat codes in video games to get more money. At first, you tell yourself you just need a little bit to get that next item, but after a while, you just hit that cash button whenever you get the itch. Lately, tethers are coming out at $100 million per shot, just flooding the market. If you're holding tethers, please be careful. Coindesk is reporting that Tether has officially confirmed the company's relationship with Friedman LLP has been terminated. It is yet to be known the reason behind the termination and who broke the relationship, but this was the, the accounting company that Tether was touting as their audit, as their, we, we have, uh, believe us, trust us, that we have conducted audits and we have all this money. Uh, in a preliminary report released in September, Friedman said Tether had $442.9 million of cash on reserve, matching the outstanding issuance of U.S. dollar tethers. But that assessment was not a full audit and contained numerous caveats. Just hours after admitting that its relationship with the auditing firm Friedman LLP had dissolved, cryptocurrency firm Tether announced that it hired Madoff and Associates to oversee all auditing operations. Well, that's kind of strange. I mean, wouldn't you want the first audit to be published or something like that before you So the, the audit was published, but I think the critical part of the audit is that the, uh, the firm did not actually look at the bank accounts. They oh. looked at, like, balance sheets and things like that, but without actually seeing... The bank, the actual bank accounts. Yeah, yeah. It, does, it doesn't look good. And why would they? Why would they hire Madoff and Associates? I don't know. I, it seems like they're shopping around till they can pay somebody off to say the right thing. Well, it's it's once again interesting to note that or say that what they want. You know, say. as I watch the growth of tethers from the period they got the subpoenas till now, I mean, it's only increasing at a more dramatic pace. And it's it's like you know the free money button. Just keep yeah. pushing it and, as much as we can until things just what topple you know, over. You know the the, the BitConnect had a cease and desist, so probably in these letters there was no cease and desist type order. I I imagine I don't I, I'm I'm, I'm I have no idea what's going to go on. I just can't imagine it ending well. The whole thing ending well. No. Well, we've got some more news to talk about here. Is this uh, Pedro? Yes. Yeah, so um, Facebook uh, new ads policy. No more. ICOs or crypto ads. So Facebook states, quote, we want people to continue to discover and learn about new products and services through Facebook ads without fear of scams or deception. 
That said, there are many companies who are advertising binary options, ICOs, and cryptocurrencies that are not currently operating in good faith. So this is now in Section 29 um, of Prohibited Financial Products and Services. I actually agree with Facebook on this decision. I mean, there there certainly are a lot of, you know, less than... Um, you know, less than up and up type products out there. And, um, you know, Facebook should do what they need to do to protect their customers. And as somebody interested in this space, I know that it takes a lot of time to go through each and every one of them to, um, to, to see if they're legitimate or not. So, um, so I definitely think it's reasonable for them not to want to hire the team it would take to, to go through and check out every ad for the little bit of revenue they would get from just one advertiser on their platform. They did give some examples, including uh, new ICO, buy tokens at 15% discount now, or use your retirement funds to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, so, that's bad. So, yeah, the, these are bad. Um, however, there's plenty of other Facebook ads that are questionable. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sure that, there, yeah, I'm sure that, you know, not every Facebook ad's on the up and up, but there there is certainly a high... A quantity of, of uh, Facebook ads that I've seen personally browsing Facebook that are like, you know, here's how to get rich quick and all this, you know, and, uh, you know, the, usually the get rich quick schemes don't work out too well. So, uh, so I, I, I think Facebook is perfectly within their, uh, certainly they're w- well within their rights to do this. And I also think they're being prudent doing this as well. Well, that's one thing that I've seen more of recently, and that's uh, scam checking sites and uh, more uh, YouTubers doing videos about, hey, watch out, this is a scam. So I think that's, that's you know, good good first step. But, I mean, there's so many new ICOs and token sales that happen that it's difficult to keep track of them all, let alone vet each and every one yeah. of them. Yeah. So Facebook, good good on you, I think. So there's a big sale of, of real estate to Blockchain's LLC. Have you guys heard about this story here? No. So on January 29th, 2018, Jeffrey Burns, uh, this story comes to us from ethnews.com. Jeffrey Burns, the CEO of Blockchain's LLC, confirmed that his com- company had acquired 67,000 plus acres at the Tahoe Reno, Reno Industrial Center, estimated at around $175 million dollars. The, uh, the Tri-Center could become home to the world's first fully equipped blockchain-based city. Huh. That is some interesting stuff. So what? led by brothers Jeffrey and David Burns, Blockchain's LLC has the stated goal of acting as a pioneer for the technological future. Since Ethereum went live in 2015, the company has quietly been working on decentralized applications development. On Twitter, Jeffrey Burns denies rumors of a cryptocurrency mining operations, noting that Ethereum will soon shift to proof-of-stake consensus algorithm. The company conceptualizes, quote, conceptualizes the and incubates blockchain powered ideas, ventures and businesses, unquote, according to the website. And that it's, quote, developing means of offering traditional financial services in the new age of digital assets, unquote, which I'm sure refers to helping people get their ICO started. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there could be loans, too. But like currently, it's like if you talk about financing, you're talking about an ICO or a token sale. All right, so uh, Burns is, uh, let's see, the company website further explains, quote, the decentralized nature of blockchain technology can catalyze tremendous economic and social change. We are advocates for such change, which, yes, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really exciting. Um, I I think he goes on to say when it's completed, the corporate campus is going to be over 100,000 square feet uh, and employ over 1,000 individuals by 2021. Wow. So, I mean, that's, this is the sort of stuff as the, the market cap goes up. I mean, there are people who have been holding and hodling, if you will, since it was, it was much uh, you know, cheaper as far as the price of Ethereum or even Bitcoin SegWit is concerned. And you know, so now there's, there's this, this wealth, this new, newfound wealth created by the blockchain, created by the rise in these currencies. And you have some really interesting and big real-world yeah, good I mean, mortar projects happening. This is this really sounds like a, a type of a think tank for for a cryptocurrency and and to further development and you know hiring a thousand people to to dedicate to this is I mean this is great. Yeah, so we'll see how that works out in Nevada, and we know that uh, we covered here on Neocash Radio that Nevada actually has some of the best blockchain laws 
protections built into their their laws. So people on blo- uh, who are in Nevada and running blockchain based businesses are going to have a lot easier time of it than say if you were in New York. Absolutely. Yeah, that's certain. It's true. So uh, is this uh, your story here, Pedro? Yep. So a major Japanese chat app line to open crypto exchange for 200 million of its monthly users. So announced today, January 31st, line will be launching its own crypto exchange and in-app trading for the application's 200 million monthly users. Line's official statement today includes that their application to operate a new cryptocurrency exchange is sitting before Japanese regulators. It is also stated that it was establishing a new company. Line Financial Corporation to serve as a base to, quote, provide a variety of financial services, including a place to exchange and transact virtual currencies, loans, and insurance. Additionally, the platform aims to promote research and development of technologies such as blockchain. See, these chat line, uh, these chat apps are, are really taking over everything. I mean, it, right. I mean, it's sure, it originally it was just sending a message to someone, and then you now text messages can have more functionality. They can include, you know, meta stuff, including you know, video and pictures and things like that. And now it's like the the app is is your portal into more. It's become a browser almost. Where people are using it for everything. And a mini wallet. You know, you can, you know, if somebody ha- uh, provides good content, you know, there's, you can tip them. And, you know, we see this on Reddit where you can, you know, tip others in, in Bitcoin Cash. So I, th- I think this is exciting and it opens up, uh, you know, the Japanese market even more into uh, the crypto space. Yeah. yeah. What's going on with Open Bazaar, Darren? Yeah, at Open Bazaar, uh, they just, uh, today they're proud to announce that Bitcoin Cash and Zcash. Integration in Open in Open Bazaar. Okay, so with this update, users will have the option to create new nodes for processing Bitcoin Cash and Zcash uh, uh, payments, respectively. Open Bazaar already allows buyers to fund their wallets with a variety of cryptocurrencies through Shapeshift, but before the, this release, all transactions were still resolved with Bitcoin. With the the rise of the network fees in 2017, it became clear that Open Bazaar users needed. Support for cryptocurrencies with fees that are more suited for small to medium-sized transactions, ASAP. This release, it actually came out yesterday, I believe, is the first step towards allowing more options for cryptocurrencies in Open Bazaar. It includes native support for nodes using one cryptocurrency at a time, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, or Zcash. Wow. So this is something that yeah, Chris was, was hinting at and talking about for a while. Yes. Yep. And especially the, the Zcash... Uh, of course, Bitcoin Cash is, is is very similar to the Bitcoin SegWit that they're already using. So the, the maybe this, the difficulty of setting it up is much less. But Zcash does require a little bit more uh, programming than uh, yeah, especially if they're using any concealed transactions or anything like that. That that uh, that's quite a there's a bunch of there's a lot of RAM that's required for that. So that's version 2.1. If you're using Bazaar, you definitely want to upgrade and make sure you're using the latest version. Uh, so new, new, uh, more, more news about Bitcoin Cash. BitPay and, uh, updates enable Bitcoin Cash. So merchants looking to accept Bitcoin Cash have gotten a boost from BitPay. Popular website plugins, uh, WordPress and WooCommerce, WHMCS Marketplace, and PrestaShop have been updated to integrate with the BitPay wallet support for Bitcoin Cash. So there you go. The, right. the, the big flood of merchants being able to accept things other than Bitcoin. Now, of course, there are still people dropping Bitcoin. Uh, we're not going to go too much into those stories right now. Or Bitcoin SegWit. People are still dropping Bitcoin SegWit because of the unreliable uh, confirmation times as well as the expensive fees. Well, m- maybe we'll be able to buy Steam games again uh, through BitPay. Yeah, maybe. Mm. The, in fact, I just recently uh, set up my own BitPay wallet uh, for my personal usage, and buying. You know that there's a ten dollar charge to buy or apply for the credit card, mm. and so I I had the BitPay wallet set up, and I was gonna fund it through with their own wallet so that it you know just streamlines the whole process, and it, it gave me a warning because I set I set the the uh, the fee so that it was not urgent, not the highest setting, but the the second highest setting because I want it con- you know confirmed today. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it gave me the warning that the the fee was twenty three percent of the the wow. cost. So it was ten dollar charge. I paid, um, you know, overall the entire it was almost what fourteen dollars or something like that. Uh, I mean, sorry, thirteen. But anyway, it's it's, it's like the, the 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 app warns you and says it's hey, listen, this is this extremely expensive fee. Yeah. Are you sure you want to proceed? Right? <laughs> like, and it's like, wow. Well, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, moving on, so we've got a story here. The uh, Tokyo-based cryptocurrency exchange CoinCheck has confirmed that it has suffered what appears to be the biggest hack in the history of the technology. Darren, this is yes, big news. Yes, in a press conference uh, um, uh, at uh, 1123, uh, the, the exchange president, Wataka Koshi Yoshi, Yoshihiro, uh, and chief operating officer uh, Otsuka, uh, estimated a loss of a loss at 58 billion yen, approximately half a billion dollars, according to Bloomberg, which attended the conference. 500 million NEM tokens were taken from CoinCheck digital wallets. So now I was around during the Mount Gox thing. Of course, Neil Cash Radio was around during the Mount Gox thing, and uh, there this this seems to be a drop in the bucket compared to the. To the to uh, to the Mount Gox situation. Well, it's yes. As far as the actual dollar amount of of losses at this point in time versus that point in time, that is a you know significant number, half a, over half a billion. Yeah. But during the Mount Gox issue, I think what people fail to really capture is that there wasn't this massive array of of markets available. There wasn't right. Ethereum and all the different Ethereum. Like NEM is a different. A coin. It's not, right, you so. know what I'm saying? So, like, there wasn't all of that. There was Bitcoin and there was Bitcoin clones, and there might have been Litecoin. You yeah, know, I like, mean, like I mean, that was it. That was back in 2014. I mean, that's that's a long time in the crypto space. So, right. Uh, right. So, uh, so, and this is a NEM tokens were taken. So, that problem very well could have very small, though negligible effect on, on Bitcoin. So, or or and Bitcoin has basically a lot of things follow uh, Bitcoin segwit. So, uh, so, so uh, anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. So be but careful the, with all your weird assets out there if you have yeah, any. Yeah, I mean, really spend money to hire talented security experts. Oh, especially if you run an exchange. <laughs> I mean, come on, come on now. So the latest news that I saw was that the the uh, the firm, the CoinCheck, was going to cover the losses. At something like with their own funding, at something like eighty-two cents on the dollar or something. I don't know exactly what the number broke down <sighs> to because they were they were talking in yen, but uh, which is good news that the the company is looking to protect their their customers or at least salvage what what is possible. I do believe that they're still operating. I just know I know that the the NEM situation is is not or is you know, obviously they they lost all their their tokens unfortunately. Uh, but moving on, we've got more stories to talk about here. The um, the yes. U.S. Yes, so uh, well, this is an interesting one. We've we've talked about issues. We've talked about Bitcoin, uh, BitConnect. We've talked about uh, Facebook b- banning some of these really sensational and and uh, sen- you know buy my ICO sort of situations. Well, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission obtained a court order freezing the assets of a Texas-based initial coin offering that claimed to have raised more than $600 million. This, this story comes to us from Bloomberg. The order was filed in federal court in Dallas and halts a rise bank from raising any additional cash from investors. So this is, this is a, a first of its kind where the SEC has stepped in during an ICO, like they were, they were, they were continuing to run this ICO, mm-hmm. and so, so quote, this is the first time in the commission has the commission has sought the appointment of a receiver in connection with ICO fraud. The uh, the head of STC enforcement said in a statement, quote, we will use all of our tools and remedies to protect investors from those who engage in fraud, fraudulent conduct in the emerging digital securities marketplace. So the asset freeze is the biggest action yet for the agency trying to police. The market of of billions of dollars raised through ICO is this year uh, in 2017. Yeah, it and definitely so, looks like the SEC is stepping up uh, its game uh, game with you know warning about fraudulent ICOs. You know they started you know making comments late last year. Now they're getting you know actively involved. Yes. Yeah, I haven't had time to to vet this particular one. It's I haven't had time to vet many of them, but uh, just the name Arise Bank. That that name alone kind of suggests they don't understand what the point of all this crypto stuff is. The reason we don't want to use all this crypto stuff is so that we don't have to use a bank, right? So yeah. so uh, the name of it right there, and, and I remember uh, the Bitcoin Savings and Trust that was a long time ago with Pirate at Forty. Uh, basically, it was a Ponzi scheme, 
Um, yeah, they, they call it savings and trust. That's like a bank. Just, it's, yeah. like, it's like, no, the whole point is you don't need to use a bank. So anything saying it's a bank in the crypto space, be very wary, period. Yes. And, and, and even if they are completely legit and they do everything they're supposed to say they're, they say they're going to do, they still call themselves a bank. And the government has a lot of rules about what it considers a bank to be. So at least in the U.S. So, so even if they do everything like moral and give the money back they're supposed to give and, and take the money and, and use it for what they say they're going to use it for, even if they do it all, you know, moral, they, if they still call themselves a bank, the government could say, hey, uh, we don't want you doing that. So using bank in your name automatically gets you additional scrutiny. Yes. Is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I established an LLC and I said I was going to give a classes and it said, oh, you're going to be a school. You're going to have to do extra paperwork. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to be a school. I'm not going to offer degrees and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and uh, so, so I could, I had to be careful, not even say classes. I mean, so, so you might say tutorials or you might say something like that. I mean, this is all just, if you want to learn math stuff and, and, uh, you know, it's nothing, you know, nothing scammy or, or weird about it. just if you want to learn math, you can take a class. But uh, you have to be careful the language you use when you're interacting with uh, governments. You're right, Darren, I, and especially when you're interacting with governments. I mean, they have their own special language. We refer to it as legalese. But you, you, you have translators out there and they're called lawyers. Yeah. I mean, literally, they're, they use a special language. It's like a coding language even. And it codes laws and... And there's a whole industry of, of, of people called attorneys to try to interpret that and, and ensure that you're following it. Yeah. Somebody starting a company calling it a bank in the crypto space, there's two things. They don't understand the whole point of crypto, and either they've done a lot of paperwork or they are setting themselves up for getting char- charged with, basically charged in a, in like in a court sense. Of, of not doing all the paperwork they need to do. So Well, and, and that's an interesting thing to bring up. Yes, today's episode highlighted a lot of activity by the government, to, to the SEC, or the, yes, SEC, and then the, uh, the commission, uh, the CTFC, that, uh, you know, they're, they're doing stuff now. They're actually going out and they're pursuing some of these, these fraudulent actors and these bad actors. And, you know, now, now is even more... Uh, of a critical time for these startups and these new projects to really think about what language they're using, what they're actually offering, what utility that token or that service is actually going to have. Yeah. And start really, you know, thinking about the the challenges that are going to come from the government. And and the way it's set up too, like the DAO, the DAO, the SEC already came out with a report and said that clearly was a security from the Security and Exchange Commission's perspective. But um, but the 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 ruling or the paper that came out was it did not seem to suggest that a utility token, like a token you have that that allows you to use a platform or something like that, it didn't suggest a u- utility token was a security. Now that doesn't mean that tomorrow they won't l- release a port that that says a utility token is a security. I'm just saying that the SEC is trying to distinguish. You know, here's the properties of a security, and for example, the DAO fit those properties. So, yeah, so so yeah. I mean, I I, I think the market is saturated in in all these tokens and all that. So, if you want to launch a token, I would encourage you not to. But <laughs> uh, if you do, uh, yeah, definitely uh, think about how the government's going to interpret what you're doing and all that. And and it would be good if you really ensure that you know there's no other project just like yours out there, right? Because uh, I think there's a lot of overlap in projects and mm-hmm. a lot of times they think, well, I'll, I'll think of a clever name for the token and, you know, really buzz it up and, and see if I can do better than somebody that's that's already started that similar project six months ago. So Yeah, and I, another thing is I'd like to see more people in the space. I mean, I, don't, I have no authority to enforce what my will is, but I would like to see more people in the space actually start up projects and use more traditional funding where they have accredited investors uh, fund with federal, you know, with normal dollars or whatever local currency and uh, actually get a business running that way. And not, uh, I mean, it's great that you can fund things on chain, but I, w- I would like to see some businesses more like started the old fashioned way uh, that may or may not interact with blockchains or not, or, or do different things. But uh I, I I think just a, a token for every project is is not necessarily the best thing to go. I mean, every project out there 
might have been able to be funded a better another way. So uh, you know, you want to consider all your options. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this is you know our first episode doing video. We're going to continue to do video now that we've got it set up, and it's only going to get better and better as we go along. So if you have any feedback or ideas or thoughts about our video, you can of course let us know on the YouTube channel, or you can send us emails, and we'll have all of that at the uh, both the descriptions in the uh, the blog as well as the YouTube channel. Um, so we also plan on redoing some of our tutorial videos or we had actually, when we first started this back in 2013, Darren, we did a bunch of, uh, a quick and, and, and dirty sort of tutorials of how to set up a wallet, how to do certain yeah. things. And so that's even valid anymore. We're going to redo all of those and the <laughs> tutorials. We're going to go, we're going to give a, a simple video that, that talks about, how to start an initial wallet for people who aren't, aren't familiar. We'll, we'll talk about an online wallet, a, a, a hardware wallet, and then we'll, we'll figure out another one, probably one you download, a full node wallet. Uh, but we'll also go in, we'll also have some, some short tutorial videos about various um, important things, whether it be your security or, or basic encryption understanding. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll figure out what, what we want. But if you have a request, please let us know. And uh, we do have a, a sort of disclaimer here. Any content, any content on Neocash Radio podcast and or website should not be regarded as financial or legal advice. Please be mindful of any and all regulations uh, regarding cryptocurrency in your particular jurisdiction. Never invest or gamble more than you are willing to, to lose. And always safeguard your digital currency by keeping it in a wallet whose private keys you control. That's right. For Neocash Radio, this is JJ. Darren. And Pedro. Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.